Hi everybody, it's me, R. Dallas. I recently sat down with Jimmy Bogard, author of Automapper and Mediator, to talk about recent developments with these libraries. This is an excerpt of that conversation. You can watch the full interview here. Enjoy. All right, so you had some choices, you had some options, like you could have just let the status quo be, in which case they slowly wither on the vine uh, because they're not getting any love or updates or things, and there are other packages that are out there, or or you could have, you know, done a number of other things. I know you described in your blog, but you know, mm -hmm. you you chose a model of licensing, uh, and I I know you put a lot of thought into that. So, do you want to talk a little bit about like how you decided that it made sense to to try and offer these to folks in a licensed manner? Hey, everybody! Thanks for watching. But real quick, I need to share something with you that I think a lot of you will enjoy. For the past couple of years, Nimble Pros, the company I co-founded, has been building out its course catalog. Veteran trainer Sarah Saduki Dukevich and I, but mostly Saduki, have recorded a bunch of great courses, and she has just released the latest course on working with architecture decision records, or ADRs. Prior to that, she wrote a comprehensive course on .NET identity that anyone building and securing apps that require logins, which is probably most of you, should probably check out. You can get 20% off any course in our catalog by using our Dallas. Now, back to the video. Yeah, so the, the good slash bad thing is this is not remotely a new problem in the, not even just the Microsoft space, like you can just go YouTube, OSS, burnout, and there's like, you know, right. 100 videos by all sorts of folks talking about this exact issue, there's the the OSS, the, the the life cycle of an OSS developer where there's like the initial excitement and then there's some growth and then there's like a lot of people and then like, oh, now burnout. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of demands in my time when you get a popular project. Um, so yeah, I did have that choice. I could have let them just just lie and just be like, uh, they're quote, quote done. But I've been in software for you know two decades now, and I know that like software is never. If someone's using it, it's not done. There's always something right. someone would like to have improved with it. Um, and then for these two libraries, their their growth was not slowing. They are still growing year over year in terms of the number of downloads. So like, well, these aren't. It's not like the community is saying we don't want this anymore. I mean, as right. I if I, there are plenty of people that don't want them, and I can go read those comments on Reddit. But yep. uh, there are still people that want these libraries. So I had this choice to make of, well, what do I do? Do I, I, I can't take away consulting time if there's nothing, if there's no funding for this. So right. then you start to go through the different, um, basically the different kind of business models of open source. And again, luckily, a ton of other people have talked about this. Like uh, Aaron Standard's a great resource because he's, he's blogged a ton about this with his projects, um, he does he like Akadanet and Peta, Peta Bridge, Peta Bridge, Peta Bridge. Peta Bridge. Yeah, Peta Bridge, not Peta, Peta. Um, uh, and several other folks have, have written blogged about this. So you kind of go down the thing of what possible means of, of income could pay for this time to not just do minimal upkeep, but actually do the, like actually improve these over time. Cause that's one thing I really missed with Headspring was I had all these clients that I could just get up and like Slack, or I think it may have been hip chat back then. I'm not sure. Right. Or just walk to their desk and like, hey, what are y'all, what are y'all doing? We actually had like tech lead meetings every two or four weeks where we get together and talk about things in our projects. And that was part of the thing of let's fold in feedback from clients about how you're using things. So something like behaviors, for example, that came about because we looked at four clients, four or five clients that were all doing similar junk. And we're like, well, this should be a first-class citizen in the library, but I didn't have that anymore. I didn't have any direct connection to, to the clients that were actually using it um, on a daily basis. So that was based on basically looking at all this model. I wanted, to, I don't want to just let these things kind of just exist and slowly die over time because I still, I still wanted these projects to be successful and people use them and like them. So, you know. Right. Um, and so the next thing was, well, what possible um, commercialization slash business options are there available for me? And there's a ton out there that's like you can sell support, for example. But because I didn't really get a lot of support requests, then just selling support hours wasn't really that feasible. Because I imagine when people needed that sort of uh, support, it was, it was like one off and random. And I could see this by looking at GitHub issues of like who was asking questions, who was asking for help on Stack Overflow and Stack 
uh, and, and GitHub issues. And it was like these sort of one-off things. And just having sort of a support contract, that'd be such a barrier of entry for them coming in and, and, uh, and signing up for something that right. I didn't, didn't seem like that was a feasible model. So then you have like things like open core as another common model as well. The idea there is if you have a free version that retains its open source, like permissive open source license, then you have things that you sell on top of it that uh, are these sort of freemium features. Um, yeah. I'm using one right now. It's so like I, I had to remember how to build web apps because um, <laughs> I, I built the websites and I built the, the things to manage the licenses and everything. Um, so I picked Tailwind and uh, I picked Tailwind and then I'm like, oh, I should could use some components. And I realized like, well, Tailwind actually has an open core model. They have Tailwind CSS and they have Tailwind Plus, which is in like all these pre-built components that she can then use because I'm not a designer, like remotely. Right. So I can just go, okay, yes, that will accelerate my development at the site. I can just pluck these components that look great and it is way beyond my abilities to come up with, like so far beyond it's hilarious. Like I'm in yeah. stick figure land when it comes to uh, designing websites. It's, it's so terrible. So that's another model, just offer a core open source and have this freemium. But I talked to several folks uh, that made this also made this leap. And um, even the some that had a successful open core model talked about the challenge of deciding which features should go into the core free version versus which should go into the paid for not free version. And yeah, there's definitely a, a conflict of, there. Oh yeah. It's like a, <laughs> it's gigantic. So even if I looked at my libraries and said, okay, I could carve off this feature. Like, I don't even know. Uh, mediator behaviors are premium versus the core is just handlers. I'm like, that's such a weird, it's so yeah. hard to define these lead lines. So I, I could spend six months developing all new like things that were add-ons on top of the open core and then launch those and hope someone would pay for them. That was pretty risky too. And yeah. I, I'm already sort of disconnected from clients. So even to understand like what do folks actually need, again, because I'd muted my GitHub notifications years ago, I don't even know <laughs> what kind of things people are looking for. I thought, no, that's that's not going to be feasible as well. Of course, the final one is um, like a, an actual commercial license. Right. Even Which is ultimately in there, where you yeah. went, right? Yeah. So the, the choice I went for was to license it commercially. With a little caveat that, that it, it's technically dual licensed, which means a it's an open source license, which is restrictive, and a commercial license. Um, so the idea that if there are folks that still want to have an open source version, then there's a more restrictive like GPL kind of license for that, um, which still allows you to like monetize it. But it it basically plugs holes in the MongoDB um, sort of model. No, I'm sorry. It, it, it adopts a similar model to like MongoDB. So MongoDB was open source. And then you have companies like, you know, big cloud companies selling Mongo, enhancing it, but none of those changes ever made it back into MongoDB core. So they change it to a more restrictive license because basically you have giant multi, multi-billion dollar companies freeloading off their work. Right. I don't think any was freeloading off of Automapper, but it's like, well, you can't really do a dual license, permissive and commercial. It's just like lawyer. Right, like here's a lawyer MIT license that says you can do whatever the heck you want. And also here's this license that says I can come after you if you use my software without my permission. Yeah. So it's like, we can't have, there are, there are libraries out there that do that, but lawyers told me like, you can't really enforce that at that point. Cause it's not really MIT. It's not really Apache. It's this weird hybrid thing. That like you're MIT unless you you are in this bucket, then you must go to that bucket. Um, right. This dual license model is is a more common model of keeping open source, but um, having the uh, commercial license as well. So like I don't know if people will want that open source license at all. That was just a well, put it out there, and if people use it, people want to do it, then there it is for them. But I'm gonna I'll probably reevaluate in a couple of years just to see like does anyone care about this? If they don't, then I just won't have it. But if they do care, then hey, it's there for you. It doesn't so cost me let, anything either way. I, let me let me make sure I understand like one at least one use case for the open source one with the GPL. If if I have a library like my clean architecture template and it uses Mediator, which it currently does, if I upgrade that to the version 13, 
I am able to use it through the dual license if, as long as my stuff is all open source and I'm using your open source license. Is that correct? Or yeah, that's right. That's that's right. the. And then I'm not really using it at all. It's just a template. And so all of my users that download that template and say .NET new project and and get it there, then they all either have to continue to make that stuff open source if they want to follow that license, or they have to deal with the licensing if they decide to use it commercially. Correct. Exactly. So they're just they're just bound to those two things. So hmm. the 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 whole that, goal that, is that like that's pretty yeah. reasonable. I mean, I think. I mean, I. I would think so, because um, the Let's we can see talk what about that just to say. Oh wait, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's hard for me to like, cause when I look at how do I connect to the community, um, that was another one of the goals I had with starting this. Was like, I want to. There's no community for these libraries today, and so I, I wanted to create that as well. But that also requires time and work and energy and stuff. So I, I would, I want to have a, a vehicle to fund those efforts as well. Um, because I the only thing I can listen to today is basically like people I meet at conferences or comments on Reddit posts and comments on my blog posts. That's about right. my connection to the community today. I don't I want to have a better connection. So that's part of this effort as well is to to create a space uh, for those folks as well. Thanks for watching. If you have more questions or comments, please leave them below. If you'd like to see the full interview, you'll find it here. Keep improving.